Okay, good evening. Uh, we'll kick off uh, the novel technology session. Um, so the way we're going to run this is we're going to ask each of the speakers to come up for a, a talk of around 10 minutes and then we're going to get them to sit down. So what I'd like to do, as we did last year, is at the end we will get all the speakers back up onto the stage. What I'd like the audience to do is if you've got questions, I'd like you to think of the framing your question so we can ask essentially all of the speakers a similar question okay in terms of get each of them to answer so so try and keep the, the questions generic if you can uh, to try and pull out some of this um, we've asked as we do every year for these guys to kind of keep it as education as they can we've really asked them where they see uh, you know their technologies you know fitting into the future of the field so uh, so that's the plan it's usually quite good fun Jim said he's going to talk about me, which I'm a bit nervous about. Um, but, you know, this is always a fun session. So uh, I think without further ado, Jim, should we get you up on stage to kick things off? So uh, I don't think Jim needs any introduction. Uh, past president of the society and uh, uh, obviously talking on behalf of Clearly. So, Jim, thanks very much. All right. Thanks so much, Ed. Um, so I totally got this wrong. Um, I, I thought we were just talking about where the future of the field is going. So I will um, try to touch on a couple of things that we're doing, but um, some of it is completely not. Um, I had five predictions of, I think, where we would be in the next five years from a field. And ironically, the first one has nothing to do with what our company does, but it's in the hardware realm. Right? So over the last two years, we saw the introduction of photon counting detector CT and my prediction is that in the next five years it will become the standard of care. And the reason I say that is because I think it is just that good. When we saw the initial introductions of dual energy CT, I had extremely high hopes that we could do material basis decomposition and really get to true tissue characterization and that didn't really pan out. But I think that with the introduction of the photon counting detectors, we're going to get there. Um, and I think we'll stop. So then I think what, when you start looking at things like we do today, and this is obviously a screenshot of our software, I think we're going to get beyond grayscale. It's not going to be gray, black, or white. And instead of saying, hey, you know what, this low density non-calcified plaque is the CT equivalent of necrotic core, I think we're going, I predict that we're just going to say that's necrotic core. And that will be um, the, the hardware technology that helps us. I think you also hear a ton of stuff these days right around generative AI. And so this was just, a, this, it's, a, it's a nomenclature and a word that we've heard these kinds of things happen, right, before. Five years ago it was all about deep learning, right, and machine learning, and now it's about large language models and generative AI. I've thought a lot about where you could apply uh, generative AI in terms of coronary computed tomography. I'll go in the past a few years. This is a paper that was pu published by Dong Hee Han using this quote unquote machine learning. And what he wanted to do was take a CT scan, just look at a baseline CT and say, hey, can I find out if, can I figure out whether or not you're a rapid progressor of disease or a slow progressor of disease? And so he created a machine learned algorithm that was quite good as compared to current ASCVD risk factors. If you applied this machine learning model, you could uh, determine whether or not somebody was a rapid progressor versus a slow progressor of disease, which I think makes a lot of difference in how you clinically approach them. And then people said, well, what do I do with an area under the curve? He's like, okay, well, what I'll do is I'll rank the feature importance of all of this, but how are you going to apply that clinically, right? So I think that one way you do it is quantitatively. So you can look at somebody currently and you can predict where they are in the future. Um, but I think what the generative AI will allow us to do is not only say, hey, you're going to be a rapid progressor, but it will help you visualize, right, so what you will look like mathematically in the future. So we will generate actual mathematical images of people so we can show Mrs. Jones or Mr. Smith, hey, if you take your medicines, this is what you're going to look like in three years. If you don't take your medicine, that's what you're going to look like in three years. So really to leverage all of that generative AI for, for risk visualization, not only risk prediction. I think we're also going to change our, our, our evaluation of coronary disease in the next five years. And so I've put up this slide a number of times, probably for the last 10 years or so. And what I've realized is that a historical approach to evaluating coronary disease started with an ischemia test. And then if we had a positive ischemia test, then we went to an angiographic test to look for a stenosis. And we never actually looked at the actual heart disease itself, which was the atherosclerosis. And so when I think of the primary disease process, it's atherosclerosis. That is coronary artery disease. And everything else is an adjective that describes it, right? Whether it's angiographic or physiologic. And I think we'll start realizing that measuring primary disease is better than measuring adjectives of primary disease. And so we'll start studying nouns instead of adjectives. 
It's depicted here, right? On the left, what you can see is a screenshot from our software. That person has no symptoms, they have no ischemia, they have no stenosis, and everybody would say, okay, that person's doing just fine. That person has an inordinate, inordinate amount of coronary atherosclerosis. That person has such high risk um, based on the trials that we know. So I think converting and transitioning with the first question that we want to ask is, do you have disease? How much? What type? And we focus on primary disease before describing it with adjectives. I think we're also going to move into a more mature phase of uh, describing coronary disease, right? If you think about any disease process that we have, whether it be cancer, Alzheimer's disease, asthma, we always have a staging system and a classification system, right? And so right now, I think we're at the point where we just started describing the staging system. So this was a paper that we published about a year and a half, two years ago where we realized like we didn't have that staging system because we'd never measured heart disease at scale. And so we developed that as stage zero, one, two, three, either by total plaque volume or percent atheroma volume. And those stages were described because they crosswalk to angiographic as well as prognostic indicators. And then what you can see here is that we can start based on that um, individualizing or personalizing treatment based upon an individual's disease burden. So that the, the therapy that we offer somebody will be commensurate to the amount of disease that they have. Um, and that was a paper that was published by Andrew Freeman and colleagues from the ACC, sort of a treatment algorithm uh, for this stage. The reason those stages are important is because they prognosticate outcomes, right? So this is uh, data from the ischemia randomized control trial of 4,000 patients um, looking at this atherosclerosis analysis over three and a half years. And you can see that there's a linear stepwise increase in major adverse cardiovascular events. And then just, you saw this uh, slide earlier today, but just published on Jack Imaging is a 10-year follow-up using that staging system, showing also linear predictions of, of adverse events, um, not only over three years, but over 10 years. And so that's the other, the problem with that is that that's just total plaque volume, right? But we know that different plaques behave very differently. I think we reviewed this. We know that from the Scott Hart study, from the Promise study, from the Iconic study, that the darker the plaque you have, the more dangerous it is. The brighter the plaque that you have, the more stable it is. You can turn these dark plaques bright. And you, now we can use this uh, kind of staging, uh, this kind of classification system really to help us identify patients at risk and personalize and uh, figure out how you can see the changes of plaque over time. That allows us to go to something like this, where we see patients who we can either describe the progression of their plaque as stabilization, regression, and progression, um, but we can also describe the changes in plaque, right? So this goes back to the conversation that Ed and I had. He's like, I don't, I don't understand what you're doing. Or he asked, like, what is it that you're trying to achieve? And what we wanted to try to achieve was this ability to not only um, assess an individual's um, disease burden, but also stage the amount of disease that they have, and then also finally classify the type of disease. So in often in classification schemes for diseases, um, they use the classification scheme to differentiate the things that are prognostic, right? So I think that we know that calcified plaque um, behaves differently than non-calcified plaque, and I think we know that as somebody changes over time, they can either stabilize 100 at time point one, 100 at time point two, they can progress, but if they progress, it's really important to know is it calcified dominant or is it non-calcified plaque dominant? And if they regress, we want to know is that truly regression or is it this concept of pseudo-regression where you take sort of a big fluffy non-calcified plaque, like a big piece of cotton candy, scrunch it all down, and then all of a sudden the apparent volume of that plaque went down, so it seems like it regressed, but nothing, the absolute mass is the same. That's pseudo-regression, where you're densifying plaque rather than making it actually go away. So I think having a classification system is going to come out in the next five years, and that will help us figure out the dynamic nature of coronary disease um, over time. And then finally, I think that we're going to get to personalized evaluation and treatment, right? So here's a slide that I put up earlier today. All of the things that we were taught to do 30 years ago have all been supplanted by advanced imaging allowing for direct visualization of actual disease, right? Mammograms, colonoscopies, lung CTs. We need to get there for heart care, right? Because what we're still looking at is these surrogates of disease, these signs of disease, the downstream sequelae of disease, but we've never actually looked at the disease itself. And now that we have a tool in the form of coronary CT angiography that allows us to look at actual disease, 
stage it, classify it in a personalized fashion, now what's the knee-jerk reflex is to say we need a randomized controlled trial to prove that treating that and that approach compared to usual care, which is treating risk factors of disease, is inferior to treating actual disease and atherosclerosis. And the reason I believe that we'll see that in five years is because if we do those trials, we will achieve guideline recommendations to finally use this tool for screening. And that is happening in five different large-scale randomized trials as we speak. Dave Newby and his Scott Hart studies about two years enrolling, the Dane Hart study, the Illumination randomized trial, the RESPECT randomized trial, and then the TRANSFORM randomized trial. So I think that over the next five years, my prediction is that the future of cardiovascular care will be personalized, and the way that it will be is through those five steps, where the improvements in hardware will drive improvements in algorithms and software, which will drive improvements in coronary disease evaluation, which will allow us to personalize somebody's stage and classification of disease, and that the treatment of those things will result and improve patient outcomes. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jim, for the donut of the progression of CT. And with that, I would like to uh, invite Tim Fonte from HeartFlow, who's going to uh, give us a perspective of HeartFlow on CCTA 2.0 and uh, quantification in the evaluation of CTA. All right, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. I've been coming to SECT for 13 years uh, with HeartFlow, and it's exciting to talk about where we see this going over the next five years. I'm going to talk about this evolution from seeing images to actually measuring data from CT and how that's enabling a new standard of care. I'll start with a quote from Bill Gates that I personally like. I have been struck by how important measurement is to improving the human condition. I believe everyone in this room is here because you want to improve the human condition. For me, certainly that's how I went from engineering into healthcare years ago. And when I started at HeartFlow, one of the first things I wanted to do was to understand how do you, how do you read CT images? I wanted to actually understand what all of you do and learn how to read CT. And I learned from many great mentors here. Uh, but I'll never forget early on reviewing a case with Dr. Jonathan Leipzig and asking him detailed questions about it. And he said, Tim, I'm sorry. I, no one's ever asked me about the third obtuse marginal branch and whether it's really 1.3 millimeters or 1.8 millimeters. And it was just kind of this new concept to him to think that way. Uh, and I realized at that point we're onto something different to be able to quantify this information out of coronary CT. We've now had FDA cleared products around quantified stenosis, quantified plaque, FFRCT. We're working on research to measure myocardial perfusion, to quantify the risk of coronary disease. And all of this gives us the ability to then actually measure uh, and improve care through data. I think the stage is set really well by the work of so many people here. Im impressive guidelines, amazing evidence, the imaging capabilities that have been advancing, established technologies now. We know that FFRCT is incorporated into clinical practice, reimbursed, used routinely. But there's really a lot of opportunity. To get to the vision we see for what coronary CT could do, we have to build capacity. There's new quantitative insights we can provide, and we can expand this utility to more patients. There's not a silver bullet here, though. I'm not here to tell you that AI is going to solve all of these problems and do everything all by itself. It's really an enabler, and it's a tool. And you should expect a lot from an AI solution. You should expect credible evidence, service and education, quality at scale. I'm showing here the reveal plaque study that Dr. Narula presented this morning. This is a prospective. 258 patient blinded study, core lab adjudicated, multi-centered data that showed 95% agreement of heart flow's plaque analysis to invasive IVIS. This is the kind of data you should expect when you have a new technology coming forth to use in clinical practice. I want to go a little deeper into quality and data at scale. This is maybe a bit behind the scenes at heart flow of things we do, but we routinely monitor the quality of what we do. We score the quality of every image that comes to us. There's human review of every case. We have tens of thousands of data points over the years of monitoring the quality and reproducibility and reliability of the results we provide. And that's really important in this field of using deep learning and AI because you can improve algorithms with more data. We're on our third generation of FFRCT now. We've done over 200,000 patients in real-world clinical use. The quantitative plaque algorithm we've developed has been applied on 75,000 patients now. 
And if I look out five plus years from now, I think we'll be on fifth or sixth generation algorithms with millions of CT studies able to power these algorithms. But I think we'll unlock really new opportunities, some of which I'm not sure I could stand here and predict for you what they may be with that amount of data, but that's what the opportunity affords with this kind of technology. Let's move to scaling it clinically. Again, to the, the potential of coronary CT to be used more broadly is so great, and I'll focus just on the US. We have to be doing this in 10 or 20 times more patients than today to make it really the predominant test that we all believe in. And there's a lot to do to scale something like that. I think we have this opportunity to take a data-first approach in this regard. So I can see a future where when you sit down to read CT, you're actually presented with data first. Quantitative stenosis data, quantitative plaque data, FFRCT, the images adjunct to that to understand it, but giving the physician an ability to be more efficient, pushing this data into structured reports where you can edit it as you need, and letting more focus be on what to do with the data and what to do for patient care. So one of the main clinical needs we have is, does a patient have coronary disease and how significant is it? The future state I see is that every coronary CT will have a quantitative analysis, which enables data-driven care. So you, we have customers now uh, at HeartFlow piloting this approach where they're using stenosis information on every coronary CT, and at the click of a button, they can get FFRCT or plaque information on the patients where it's appropriate. I think in the future we could do this on every coronary CT and have a really data-driven approach. This only matters if it's supported by evidence, though. So back to the data for a moment. Every measure that we've developed and are working on in research has been validated against a reference standard, whether that's FFR or plaque or vessel size or perfusion information. It's all been validated. And then we've taken a thoughtful approach from there of looking at outcomes and utility and how to actually give context to what this means in clinical information. This example here, five-year outcomes on FFRCT data, showing that the actual numeric value of FFRCT, whether it's 0.6 or 0.7 or 0.8, actually has a big influence on the amount of risk that patient has of downstream events. Clinical need two, how do we optimize treatment and is treatment effective? In a future state, I see interventions and surgeries will be planned and guided by data from coronary CT. So again, we have leading centers around the world pioneering this approach. Uh, Dr. Carlos Collette is leading the really incredible P4 study where physicians are using models of anatomy and plaque and physiology and post-PCI predicted physiology and myocardial information. They're making a plan for their intervention before they do it and comparing this to an, an ad hoc approach. This has the potential to completely change the way coronary interventions are done, and there's so much excitement and enthusiasm around this, and I can't wait to see the data. Similarly, Patrick Sorois is exploring this approach with fast-track cabbage, planning surgeries ahead with CT and FFRCT, not doing a traditional coronary angiography, but going straight to surgery from this incredible non-invasive data. And HeartFlow is committed to building the tools that will help enable this in clinical practice. On the medical therapy side, I agree with what Dr. Min talked about in this one. Medical therapy will be guided by coronary CTA. Progression of disease will be quantitatively tracked. We've now shown we can do this for anatomy, for physiology measures like this case here shows, for quantitative plaque, both in the change in plaque but also the change in plaque composition over time. Studies like Flow Promote, uh, like Evaporate, and many more, I think we'll see new therapeutic drugs evaluated and tracked over time for effectiveness using these measures of data from CT. Clinical need three, this is probably the big one, how do we prevent coronary events from happening in the first place? The risk of coronary events will be predicted by AI, leveraging all this great, incredible data we can derive from CT and allowing earlier preventative treatment. We've built a model now at HeartFlow, taking anatomic information, physiologic information, blood flow, information about the myocardium, plaque quantification information, putting it together into an AI model that can predict the risk of a coronary lesion rupturing. The Emerald One study showed that this combination of physiology and plaque together best predicted which lesions would rupture. We have an Emerald Two study underway with more patients, uh, fully enrolled, analyzed, and hopefully presented later this year. Even using current technologies, though, coronary CT and FFRCT, uh, we've had a study now that's shown in peripheral artery disease patients, very high-risk patients with no known cardiac disease, using coronary CT and FFRCT to guide their treatment 
has improved their survival rate at three years from 73% to 89%. So if you think about using measurement to improve the human condition, I think that's pretty incredible to have an imaging test and an AI-based technology be able to take outcomes of patients from 73% to 89% survival. So then how do we reach scale? I think this all starts and ends with collaboration. We need providers, industry, and societies to come together, make sure there's the appropriate evidence in place, to make sure these technologies are reimbursed like we've been able to do with FFRCT, to ensure quality both on the imaging side, but also on, on the product side. This is a two-way street of quality. Uh, and implementation. We have to be able to implement these technologies into care. Uh, at HeartFlow, we have a new platform called HeartFlow One that now makes this available in one solution where you can send every coronary CT to HeartFlow and get quantified stenosis information, FFRCT at the, on the patients that it's appropriate, and quantified plaque information as well. So we see this as the building block towards doing this and being able to deliver data insights from coronary CT to help manage patients. And I'd be remiss if I didn't acknowledge uh, great work by the SCCT in this spirit of collaboration with physicians and industry. Uh, if you're thinking of planning or growing or launching a new CT program, I would definitely recommend checking out the SCCT starter kit. It's full of incredible resources on how to do this. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. Uh, Next up is Amy Dubig, who is, is known to many of us uh, from GE Healthcare, who's going to talk about Cardiac CT uh, on the horizon, pioneering technological advances shaping the future of cardiovascular imaging. Thank you, Amy. Thank you. And thank you, Tim, because I really didn't want to follow Jim. That was like, <laughs> oh. So I appreciate you taking the hot seat for me. Uh, so thank you, everybody. As I said, I am with GE Healthcare and happy to share with you a little bit of what's today and what we see as the future. Uh, so what is on the horizon? Uh, as normal, standard disclaimer, I'm going to talk about things that aren't products and uh, are in development. So there's a, a mixture in here. But one of the things that uh, I want to talk about is access. And I think this is a really important piece. So how are we going to build this dream state of cardiac CT, cardiac CTA everywhere in the next five years? And I think access plays a huge role in this. Right? There's increasing um, access to angiography should be a top priority for all of us across the world. Cardiovascular disease continues to be one of the top mortality events. Um, at the same time, there's increasing expenditure, healthcare expenditure, expenditure globally and high-tech technology, more access to care. How do we build access to cardiac CTA care? There's that rising demand. We have continuous technological innovations. There's broader patient population because of those technological advances. Um, but what we see, actually, is still a really low percentage of sites that are doing cardiac CT. According to the AMR survey report, right, less than 30, approximately 30% of all sites offer some type of cardiac CTA imaging. When we compare that to general angiography, you can see we've got a massive rate of improvement. How can we build access? I think this is one of the key objectives that we need to address in the next five years. How? How do we do this? We've been talking about it for a long time. Everybody in this room probably thinks that uh, it should be much higher than it is as we do. Um, but I think it starts at the very beginning, right? If we think about the acquisition piece of it, when this started 15, 20 years ago, uh, the, the decisions were pretty complex. When you sat down to do a cardiac CTA, the, the decisions the technologists had to make were multifaceted. Cardiac CT has always been a bit of a game of prediction. What do we think is going to happen when we hit go? What's going to happen at x-ray on time? And you have to make decisions up front on what that is going to give in the best image quality in the end. Huge improvements have come, though, with simplified protocols, especially with whole heart scanners, where you no longer have to make that trade-off of, do I need an image in systole? Do I need an image in diastole? Do I need to worry what the heart rate is going to do over a 15, 20 second breath hold? Those decisions are going away because we have automated tools to help to make that decision, and we also have whole heart coverage where we're not going to worry about misregistration beat to beat. 
That means that technologists who maybe were too intimidated to volunteer to say, hey, I'll, I'll step up, I'll learn how to do cardiac CTA, that's lowered the bar, it makes it easier for them, right? So now you're not necessarily limited to when is my lead technologist on staff ready to do it, I can, do, I can offer coronary CTA to a broader range of patients because I have a broader range of staff that's capable of doing the scans. I think this was a huge step in increasing access. Also with the whole heart coverage, right, we can take on patients that were too risky before, right? If you had patients that had erratic heart rates or AFib, those were patients you'd be like, oh, I, don't, I don't think we should scan them. My ability to get a good scan, it's too risky. I'm not going to give them the x-ray dose. I'm not going to give them the contrast. We'll figure out something else to do with them. Whole heart scanning has made that. Now it's worth the risk. Your chance of getting a good scan is a very high probability. That also is increasing our access. And then we look at what the team at Aranet is doing with the mobile cardiograph. Right? How do you take CT to the patients who aren't near to those larger institutions that have the quality type of scanners or maybe the, the radiologist, the cardiologist to do the interpretation, um, but bringing the, the technology to the patient? Much like mammography is done for women's health, bringing access to women across the world, I think mobile CT is another great way that we will improve access. And then ease of use. This is another big thing, right? We've talked about it from the protocol standpoint, but there's a lot that goes behind that, right? It's not just one attribute that comes together to make the, the ease of use and challenging exams. It's a whole, a whole portfolio of tools that come together, right? Coverage is key, without a doubt. If you have one heartbeat to worry about versus five or 10 heartbeats, it makes things a lot simpler. So without a doubt, that's a big one. But when you combine that with fast rotation with high power MA to be able to scan patients of all walks of life, regardless of what their heart rate is when they come into the CT suite. That is a, a big, big piece of being able to get consistent, standard, good image quality. When you couple those hardware technologies in with software technologies like motion freeze, snapshot freeze, motion correction, true fidelity for substantial image quality improvements, and then effortless workflow. All of those things combined together, what is going to help build access to good quality, consistent mm -hmm. images. If you've uh, set in on many of our presentations or our talk tracks, you'll hear us talk about effortless workflow quite a bit. You might wonder what that is. Um, and again, it's not one single attribute. Right? It is a collection of features and thoughtful design that come together to make a cohesive package. So as I said, CT's always been a bit about predicting the future, what's going to happen once we inject contrast, once x-ray comes on, once they hear the rotor come up and nerves set in. Right? Technologists have had to make those predictions before and now there's tools like auto gating that help manage and monitor the heart rate prior to those x-ray on events. Perspective one beat acquisition, auto prescription where my patient is at ISO center, where my scan range is auto set for me, right? I'm really focusing on the patient versus all of those setup procedures that have happened before. My patient has an arrhythmia in the middle of my scan. I've got some insurance because I've got things like smart arrhythmia management to be able to repeat that scan. I can still modulate MA. I think this is one of the coolest things, right? In one beat, you can still modulate MA. You can still set a peak MA at a targeted heart rate and then lower your MAs to still have full functional at the best image quality, or excuse me, at the, to get a whole heart revolution, but, um, but not have to give up your CINE capability, right? So things like that really come together to make that workflow effortless and to be able to take patients like this and to still scan them, right? 136 beats per minute, no beta blockers. That culmination of all of those effortless workflow features come together to generate beautiful image quality, even when you're throwing at it very complex, difficult patients that you would maybe shy away from if you did not have access to all of those tools. I think I clicked too many times, I have to be patient here. more time. All right. Um, motion correction. I want to talk about this just a little bit more because this has a lot of runway. 
right? Temporal resolution is one thing. How fast do you spin the gantry? But I'm sure all of you have had experience where you have a stable, low, moderate heart rate. Uh, you would think you have perfect image quality, but they're not as motion free as you expected coming off, right? We can't forget that the heart is constantly beating, stretching, turning, twisting, uh, moving in all dimensions. It's not always coming back to the same position. And if you're using multiple beats to acquire that data, it's very important to have some technology to help clean up that residual motion artifact. And this is where intelligent motion correction really plays a role, right? Can it, it can project, it can follow the velocity and trajectory of the vessel and correct the motion. Again, a patient like this at 139 beats per minute, variable heart rate, probably would shy away from it if you did not have an arsenal of tools to be able to throw at it to get fantastic image quality. These tools aren't everywhere, right? Five years, I hope these tools are everywhere and everybody has access to them. Motion correction is going to extend beyond just a coronary CTA role, right? As we think about functional imaging and motion correction, we see the snapshot freeze technology being able to help with the visualization of cine images and I think unlocking a whole new clinical area for heart disease and for CT diagnostic capability when you can have motion free imaging across an entire heart cycle. Right? Look at that RCA. How many times can you watch an entire R to R interval and see the RCA in its entirety across the full R to R? These things are going to make it a lot easier to, di to diagno diagnose different types of heart diseases. The key too is connecting this workflow to the scanner. Historically, things have been a bit disjointed uh, and we see the future of bringing that all together. So your scanner is a central piece to how you're going to scan that patient, but we see the scanner is also the ability to be able to prescribe what you want as your end output. So if we think about automated CACs, that's pretty common, pretty straightforward, right? But what now if your automated CACs actually sent information back to your CT console to help dictate what comes next? Do you need to use a high definition mode because there's a lot of plaque in those coronary arteries? Maybe you want to do a CT perfusion because that's part of your protocol and it's better to do that before your CTA. You don't have the patient wait time for the myocardium to clear. So using that information that you can get rapidly and automatically to help facilitate what comes next is a bi-directional communication of a connected workflow. Automatic coronary labeling, attract views, the plaque analysis tools, all of those things automatically generated and sent to where you want to read, but at the same time investing in interactive tools because disease is complex, cases are complex, and sometimes you need to be able to go deep and interact with it to be able to get to the full story for that patient. So having that combination of automation and interactive tools to be able to accompany all patients will be, will be key. And we see this going beyond just the diagnosis, right? Primarily we're using it to diagnose, does a patient have atherosclerotic disease or not? Is it significant or not? In the future, this will be moved more strongly into planning, intervention, and monitoring. As Tim said, the P4 trial that's going on with the team with all led by Dr. Collet is fantastic work. How do you use CT to really help with the interventional planning? this should become more standard, standard of care, right? There's a wealth of information that the CT provides. Some of the things that we already take for granted, but if that information can be incorporated into the interventional plan prior to that patient entering the, the suite, how much more effective will their treatment be, right? Not only the plaque location, density, the flow estimates, but device planning, right? Full planning and guidance during the intervention right, using their CT as a visual aid to help guide them in interventional. Spectral imaging is another area that is underexplored, I would say. Part of it has been a spatial, uh, spatial resolution uh, challenge. Part of it has been a workflow challenge. I think those are both sol solvable and we see technologies in development that are going to increase them. Not only from the, the beam hardening reduction to the virtual non-contrast type of exams, but 
we haven't yet tapped into what other energies are available. What can we do if we separate muscle, water, fat? What other information can we glean from that? So extracting more information out of our CT scans, I think, is on the horizon. We see this coming with the photon counting as well. Right? Moving beyond spectral imaging into photon counting is a fresh new world of discovery. The ability to separate the interaction of the X-ray photon with the structures that it's in interacting with across its path, measuring the energy level of that photon, and mapping it out, separating it out, is almost like giving a new DNA to a CT scanner. There's a wealth of things that are yet to be discovered that are going to frame the future for cardiac CT as we move into this era of photon counting. So with the ability to extract new and better information comes the responsibility of better connection of the entire workflow and framework. Post-processing will continue to become more automated. The time spent interacting with images will become less, uh, maybe not existent in some cases. Um, but the integration is really not done there because how do we get all of this information out? How do we extract it and share it, disseminate it with referring physicians, with patients? How do you integrate the images with the findings? I think this is a key piece of a key responsibility for us going forward. How do we share? How do we get the information out to the patients and the referring physicians? And I predict that part of the future will be exactly this. Right, a tight linkage between the post-processing and the reporting, images and measurements, all displayed and organized in a meaningful way. So in summary, what may the future of cardiac CT look like? I think it's improved patient access through automation and simplification of the acquisition, a broader range of CTs that are capable of generating high quality CT exams, we will continue to increase the information that is extracted from a single scan and assist in a more comprehensive diagnosis, expanding the role of CT for patient management, and a connected working environment. It's making it easier to look at priors, to link images from prior exams, to link the quantitative measurements to the images that they're related to, and to integrate that into a report to streamline the communication and build the awareness of the advantages that cardiac CT can offer patients. Thank you. Thank you, Amy. And uh, I would like to introduce now uh, Bernard Schmidt uh, from Siemens Healthineers, who are going to talk about past, present, and future of cardiac CT. Bernard. So thank you very much for this uh, nice introduction. Um, yeah, it's a pleasure for me to get the opportunity to present here about yeah, really the past, the present, and the future of Cardiac CT. And uh, I took it very seriously. So I really want to talk about the past, where it all started, present, where we are as of today, and also where the future of Cardiac CT will be. So when we look into the history of computer tomography, then in the end, it's something where we really had been from the very beginning. And then in the decades thereafter, we were contributing with our innovations substantially to how now the history of uh, computer tomography actually had been. And uh, just to mention a few of the uh, innovations that really, from my perspective, are game-changing was, for example, the introduction of dual-source CT in the year 2005, substantial improvement with regard to temporal solution, just one example. Another one, the introduction of the tint filtration in the year 2013, substantially um, reducing and enabling the potential for saving radiation dose. And last but not least, also the introduction of the first photon counting CT system in the year 2021. In general, when we look into the topic of um, innovation, then we focus on three different areas. We look, of course, on the one, what uh, can we do for the patient to make, uh, have him a kind of a good experience. Secondly, we also look into what can we do for the staff, for the techs, yeah, to improve the workflow, typically AI-driven, with regard to efficiency and also um, consistency of the values. And last but not least, of course, what can we do for the physician itself, yeah, with regard to excellent images, consistent image quality, to enable a good and confident diagnosis. Having that said, um, let me start with the past, where it all started, actually. And when we look into the really the first, very first steps in coronary CTA imaging, then I have to say that we really were the pioneer and the leader 
um, in innovation. What we see on the left-hand side, these are actually images, a volume-rendered image from the first patient that had been scanned on a CT system to assess the coronary arteries. It was on a four-slice system. It also had been mentioned today in the, in the very early session here. Um, it, it basically demonstrated the capability of computer tomography to really visualize the coronary arteries. So the first images here, first patient on the left-hand side. Subsequently, then one year later, the first study that basically indicated that one also uh, published by Stefan Achenbach in circulation here in the end, going into a similar direction, a uh, study with 25 patients, demonstrating and showing very nicely, um, and including the capability of this technology, visualizing of the coronary artery lumen on the one hand side, and also being able to really perform something like assessment of the coronary artery stenosis. In the time thereafter, the big um, task was really to improve the quality of the data and improve the diagnosis. And this can be mainly done by the improvement of the temporary resolution. As coming from what we have on the left-hand side, the big steps forward had been made with the introduction of um, dual-source CT imaging in the year 2025. Here, we were able to substantially improve the temporary resolution substantially below um, 100 milliseconds. And what you can see on these examples here, it's not the improved resolution in the end. What you see in the improvement image quality was really made, perceived as, and in the end, made by the improvement in temporary resolution, perceived as an increase in sharpness of your data. Now, where, where are we as of today? And that's what you see on the right-hand side, cardiac solutions for every solution, for every situation. We are able to acquire images of the heart here at various heart rates at, in a low KV setting to save radiation dose. We are able to scan um, data from periodic patients uh, with less than a millisecond and are able not only to look into the morphological information, but also look into the function information. What is the present? Where are we as of today? And if you look into the possibilities for image analysis, then this is typically towered by um, artificial intelligence. We have different areas where we can work on. We can look into the anatomical assessment, assessment of the cut rod score, the lumen itself, the stenosis grading. We could look into the plaque morphology, assess basically composition here in the various ways. We can look into the physiology. We can look into uh, and provide information of the, uh, of the perfusion itself, the myocardial perfusion. We can look into the ECV, the extracellular volume. We can provide information about the inflammation and also assess the treatment planning. However, all those different options and techniques in the end rely on an excellent image quality. And there's still a, a lack in what we have as of today with regard to ability to visualize and show anatomical details on the one hand side and also to provide some functional information. So this lack in the end is now solved with the introduction of photon counting technology. What we see here is the traditional way of how we acquire and detect X-ray quanta. It's uh, with um, scintillation, scintillator material. So the X-ray coming in there, interacting with the scintillator material, the, the, the information or the energy is translated into the light and the light is measured by a photodiode. Within this two-step detection approach, unfortunately we lose the information, the energy information of this interacting quanta, and this is uh, not a drawback in the case of photon counting technology. Here we are working with a semiconductor between an anode and a cathode. The interaction is happening. We are measuring the energy of this interacting quanta directly. We are able to determine the energy level, and therefore always for any of the acquisitions, we are able to derive the energy information. In addition to that, the other unique opportunities that you're able to go and can go to a high resolution without compromising your dose efficiency of CCT system. In addition to that, there are also other opportunities that I've shown here on the right-hand side. For example, the ability to completely eliminate the electronic noise, enabling and allowing you to go to uh, lower dose levels. And last but not least, the other advantage is that you have a better detection of low energy quanta, which are the one really carrying the information in the end, providing you with images with a higher um, contrast in the data. Now let me share some uh, examples, some images with you, illustrating and demonstrating uh, here the big benefit of being able to go to a substantially high resolution. This is a very nice example here uh, from uh, the hospital uh, Semmelweis here from uh, in, in Budapest. They very nicely illustrate and demonstrate here the capability of assessing the instant risk stenosis in this case here uh, in the LED, so exceptional image quality never seen before with the um, slice thickness of 0.2 millimeter. This is just one example. I have another one, but personally 
I'm very impressed about this is here from the group um, in uh, Pisa. We are looking at a 2.5 millimeter stand, extremely small on the left hand side. Uh, what you can see in the cross sectional cuts here, you are able really to see and assess the lumen itself. So, very the narrowing, you can see where the lumen is. You also are able to see where the restenosis is happening. And in the end, if you compare the quality that you obtain with this technique here and compare that one to conventional line, you see the big step forward with regard to image quality improvements. The benefit of that one also with regard to clinical pathway and change in clinical pathway also already had been demonstrated in the first clinical study. So this is a paper on the left-hand side from the group in Freiburg investigating and assessing that. On the right-hand side, you see the summary of that one in the end concluding that about 50% of individuals could have avoided an invasive angiogram simply based on information from the PCCT alone. So a very good message in that field. Now, as I mentioned, uh, we are not, not only have the ability and the capability of going to extremely high resolution, we also can combine that one without compromising um, the, um, the um, temporal solution. We also can utilize the spectral information in any of our CT scans. Opportunities for that one are shown on that slide here. So when we look at this uh, monoenergetic image on the one hand side, there's lots of heavy calcifications, uh, also some uh, iodine that you nicely can uh, see. And with an algorithm, what you're able to do is you can remove the iodine from the data set and can generate virtually a so-called pure lumen calcium image, which in the end allows you to quantify the amount of calcium in the data set. What you also can do, you can turn it around and use and utilize the spectral information to get rid of the calcium, including the calcium blue. So you see here a case where there's substantial calcification preventing you from assessing the coronary arteries, and with a single click with adult additional editing, you are able to remove the calcification from the data set and have a pure view at the lumen itself and allows you to an easy evaluation of the stenosis levels of that patient. This technique also can be used in a different way. It also can be used for any kind of predictive um, tooling, for example, in the case of CDFFR evaluation. So what we see here on the left-hand side, if you're really working with the conventional images, you see a substantial drop in the flow rate when you take the conventional images. However, if you go for the pure lumen images where the calcium had been removed, you see a substantially higher values for the flow, in this case, very nicely, excellent, and very good match with what you also have gotten in the case of the angio examination, in this case, 0.7. Besides the um, spectral uh, utilization and uh, the utilization of spectral data in the area of coronary artery, you of, of course also can use the spectral information for the assessment of the myocardium. And also here, first studies have demonstrated here from the guys in Zurich and also from the group at MUSC that there is a huge potential by just adding a scan after the coronary CDA examination that this provides you with. Uh, the iron information in the myocardium. Those studies have very nicely demonstrated excellent agreement with conventional techniques on the one hand side and also excellent um, correlation with what you get on a MR examination. In addition to that also, you can use it very nicely as you see it on the right hand side for a quantitative relation of the extracellular volume. As you might appreciate from those images in a brilliant image quality, you're able to see what is my ECV information in this case in correlation and comparison to what you can obtain and typically get in the case of an MR examination. It also can be used. Final example here, for example, for a better scar delineation uh, for the ablation planning. Here on the right bottom side, you see very nicely uh, side by side comparison what you can get with a CT uh, ECV information on the one hand side and compared and being compared that one um, to um, the uh, uh, ECP map from the interventional procedure. What is it what the future will bring? What do we see in the future? And in the end, of course, since we are now able with a photon counting CT system to go beyond just two energy levels, we can acquire simultaneously three and four energy levels. Of course, there's a huge opportunity to not just, just look for the iodine in one contestation, but look into multiple contestations. For example, gadolinium in one. And this had been very nicely shown in the study shown here on the right-hand side. In addition to that, also huge opportunities also to further improve the workflow and the workflow automation. You all might have heard from the topic of large language models of the opportunity with so-called ChatGPT. So what we see here is one of the huge opportunities of that technology. What we see on the left-hand side is a prior diagnostic procedure report. It's very unstructured. The huge opportunity for this technique is now that you can derive a kind of a structured information from the unstructured report on the left-hand side. The information that you derive then in such a way can be used in a 
very intelligent way to automize your workflow that you have on your CT system. This means, for example, so based on a prior information, based on those reports, you can go in and have an automatic workflow, as it's illustrated here, that picks the right scan protocol, performs the right acquisition based on the prior information, and in the end also provides you with respective and desired images for making your diagnosis, as example, are shown here on the right-hand side, for example. Now, everything what has been shown by me and also by the prior uh, presenters, let's compare that one to what has been um, mentioned by David Blumke and um, published a few months ago um, in radiology. So he was listing basically the 10 topics which might be um, accomplished in the year 2040. So it's a long list of things where he's looking forward and he's suggesting this is something where people should work on and where we might be in the year 2040. When you look at that list, then the nice thing is that uh, some of them are already available as of today. For example, if you look at the topic of photon counting CT, this is something that we have already available today and can be used in clinical practice. There are some of them, they're still under active development. For example, if you look at number six and seven, comparison to MRI and having some additional information. But maybe today also I show to you that there might be already something that you can do with photon counting CT, which brings the ECT much, much closer to the MR, for example, in the area of the um, extraction of the extracellular volume. And there are a few others, um, for example, the phase contrast CT, where we really have to see if this is really something that ever will be accomplished and being possible in a clinical scenario and setup. And with this one, I'm at the end of my presentation. And um, the future of cardiac CT, from my perspective, is a combination out of two things. On the one hand side, the topic photon counting CT, allowing you to go to a substantially high resolution at lower dose values, always have spectral information being available on the one hand side, and combine that one with the information from utilization of artificial imaging to have in the end something that we can call then a one-stop shop. Thanks very much. Thank you, Bernhard, and I would like to invite all the speakers now to the podium and uh, answer some of the questions from the audience. Okay, so we'll go out to a question. I'm conscious that we're a few minutes away from uh, a drink, so I, I won't keep you longer than necessary, but any questions from the floor? Okay, so I, I will start off with one, and I think Marosh has another. So all of you uh, mentioned the need to increase the capacity of cardiac CT. However, we also know the cost of these technologies is going up and up, and there's, there was a discussion that we had in the, in the board of directors yesterday about, you know, do we want CT to be a low-cost test that is done for many, or does it become a high-cost test, particularly when you add on, uh, you know, some of the decision aid tools that we've discussed or, or consider, you know, the cost of some of the advanced technologies? So if you say a photon counting scanner is ballpark $2 million, a lot of the sort of decision aid tools are going to cost you anyway, let's say a ballpark for over a thousand dollars. That's significantly escalating the cost. Yet at the same time, we want to expand cardiac CT. Yet at the same time as that, it's being reimbursed at a figure that's going down and down. So I guess my question to the three of you is, is how would you approach that given that dichotomy that we are clearly facing at the moment? I'm happy to start. Uh, from our perspective, from not the hardware side, but providing a test like FFRCT, I think cost and payment go hand in hand. So if the payment is appropriate for the cost, then the healthcare system can overall be okay. You know, we've had, we have evidence that FFRCT is cost effective for the overall healthcare system. Our customers make a margin on it. We make an appropriate amount to run the company. So I think all those things can work out together. I would say that's also a very similar situation with regard, maybe you mentioned the price of the two million, whichever is right or wrong, I don't know, I cannot comment on that, yeah. Uh, but of course it's a higher cost than you normally have for a CT system. But that's also what we are seeing a little bit, um, the photon counting technology going into that really adds some additional value. And in the end also the hope is and the idea is to um, get additional money to the different institutions by simply providing reimbursement for those additional opportunities that you have, which in the end would be to some extent compensate for those additional costs. And for sure, I'm very convinced that as we go down the, the years, yeah, that also the cost of those new technologies will go down, of course, similar to every other new technology, thinking of um, iPhones, whatsoever. So the price will for sure over the next few years, I guess, um, drop. 
I think uh, from my perspective, it's a natural progression, right? As new technology comes out, it will roll down to other scanner portfolio lines. So the automation, the ease of use, the ability for more people to perform cardiac CT is going to get easier and easier because that's the natural evolution of technology introduction. I think the cost is an interesting piece, right? When you think about additive technologies coming in, the extra information that you derive from it where will that end up, I think, is a little bit more foggy in, in my mind, but I do think the basic diagnosis and the basic use of cardiac CT is, is going to naturally evolve where you won't need the $2 million scanner to get a good quality diagnostic coronary CTA that gives you the basic answer that you're looking for for your patients. Thank you. That was a really great uh, set of presentations. Really enjoyed it. It was very informative. Um, I'd just like a, a comment maybe regarding uh, how our payment system is structured in the United States, which is basically a fee-for-service system, and how this impacts the utilization, acceptance of new technologies like, you know, CT and then specifically all the things that are under the CT umbrella, because right now in the U.S., uh, at least in cardiology, um, we're, we're still about 55 percent private practice and about 45 percent employed. Private, private practice is heavily influenced by, um, you know, fee-for-service, you know, specifically related to the use of echo nuclear imaging in private practice offices, which I think sort of takes away part of the opportunity in, in terms of the market for the use of uh, CT technologies. So how do you, how does that all fit together, do you think? Dr. Nickel, can we stay for an hour to answer that one? <laughs> Come on, Tim, it was a simple question. <laughs> Dr. Zafin, it's a really good question. I think it's, I mean, it's inevitably intertwined in all of this that the financial aspects make adoption of new technologies challenging. Um, you know, we see certainly what you said, that there's, there's embedded financial incentives for doing tests that providers have. If you own a SPECT camera, you make money doing SPECT images, for example, and the cost of a new CT scanner has to be weighed against that and the reimbursement for everything we talked about and completely switching that. But we've seen a lot of healthcare institutions start to take really good steps in this. And it doesn't have to be an overnight change. You don't have to do a 180 degree shift of going from 100% to 0% change of testing. So we've seen a lot take stepwise approaches to growing capacity for CT year over year in a thoughtful way, adding scanners, adding new technologies, and using the reimbursement from those to fund the next step. I think certainly there have been some changes in the guidelines recently that have downgraded the use and the recommendations for uh, nuclear imaging, just as an example, and that may help uplift things that were, which really provide very high value uh, that can't be provided by any other techniques. And, you know, CT certainly, I think, meet, meets that bill. I would add maybe just one thing, and I, I apologize. I didn't, wasn't able to attend the whole presentation, um, but I think the Atrium team did a really good job today in presenting and made the point of you have to look at the, the whole picture, right? Some go down, some go up, but you, when you look at it holistically, then it tends to, to balance out. So definitely not an area of my expertise, but uh, I think the, the Atrium team today did a really good job of presenting that holistic picture of, of how it can be done and still be successful. Thank you. Thank you very much. I would like to thank our industry partners for first their support of the organization and for excellent presentations about the novel technologies or what the future brings. So again, thank you. And now uh, all out for the drinks, <laughs> plural. <laughs>